going to take a break from Acts, and we're going to look at the church and what it means to be a member of the church, what it means to be a part of Christ's church. You say, why are we doing that? Well, we're doing that because a number of our visitors are here have uh, expressed an interest in membership, and so we want them to understand, and we want to remind ourselves of what it means to be a member in Christ's church. I hope and pray you didn't just come to church this morning. I hope you came as part of the church. Meaning what? I mean, you can come to a church building, which is just a big barn-like structure we all gather in. We could meet as a church outside. We could meet on the beach. We could meet in a home. We could meet like some Christians do underground. So it isn't just coming to church. It's coming as part of the church. For the church is the people of God. The other reason, or the reason more specifically for this message this morning is, last Sunday as I was leaving, somebody stopped me and asked me about what does it mean? What does it actually look like to become a Christian? I thought, that's a great question. And so he said, maybe there are some other people in our church that don't really understand what it means to become a Christian, what it mean, what that actually look like, looks like from the Bible. There's lots of things that are told and said about what it means to become a Christian that don't come from the Bible, but there are some very clear things that do come from the Scriptures. And so this morning, I want to take us to the book of Matthew and chapter 18, Matthew 18, and we're going to read just the first four verses, but as you're finding your place, and I'm doing the same, uh, just to give you the context, the, the context of Jesus' words in Matthew 18 starts back in Matthew 16. And in verses 13 to 16 of chapter 16, Peter gives his confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In verses 18 and 19 of chapter 16, Jesus describes his building of his church on the rock that is himself. And then in verses 21 to 23, Jesus tells the disciples of his coming suffering and death, at which point Peter, emboldened maybe by Jesus' words a few verses ago, takes Jesus aside and begins to rebuke him. If you can imagine rebuking the Son of God and only to be rebuked by Jesus in some very strong words. In verses 24 to 28 of chapter 16, Jesus describes the cost of their discipleship to his disciples, which includes denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Christ, even to dying the death that he died. And then in Matthew 17, verses 1 to 13, Peter, James, and John travel up the Mount of Transfiguration, and there they see Jesus revealed in His glory. In verses 14 to 23, Jesus casts out a demon. He teaches on faith and prayer, and then He reminds them again of His coming, suffering, and death in Jerusalem. Matthew 18, then, is Jesus' fourth of five great teaching passages in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 18 records and describes for us what it is to be in Christ's kingdom and Christ's community. So in verses 1 to 6, we have conversion, new birth, humility to enter the kingdom. In verses 7 to 11, we have Jesus' description of radical commitment to holiness that's required for the kingdom. A little time out. If you have a chance... Afterwards, ask me about a great message I listened to just this week. I listened to it not once, not twice, but three times. It was uh, John Piper speaking on uh, Christ died for your holiness. It was compelling. It was convicting. I had to go back and listen to it, like I said, three times. It's worth the listen. We'll probably draw a little bit of material for that into that message in a couple of weeks. It's Radical commitment to holiness that's required for the kingdom. In verses 12 to 14, we see the devotion of shepherds to the sheep. And then in verses 15 to 20, we see the church's discipline of sinning members. And then verses 21 to 35, the forgiveness that Jesus requires of both church and disciples. So let's this morning just consider verses 1 to 4 of Matthew 18. And we won't get through the whole lot, but we'll look at a good part of it. Let's read together. Matthew 18, the Bible says, 
At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's about that time. Meaning what? Meaning it's about the same time as, the, as verses 24 to 27 up in chapter 17 that this fourth teaching of Jesus takes place. Jesus approaching suffering and death is prominent in his mind, but Jesus' disciples have something else entirely in their minds. Jesus has made his statement about building his church on the rock, and which is misinterpreted by so many to mean Peter as a rock. But Jesus didn't mean that. Of course, he meant himself, but so many misinterpreted it. Jesus often separates his disciples, taking the three, Peter, James, and John, with him while leaving all the others alone by themselves. There seems to be some form of hierarchy within the 12 disciples. And the disciples have by now realized that Jesus is indeed their long-awaited Messiah, although the exact implications have yet to sink in for them. They expect His kingdom to begin in a matter of days or weeks as they arrive in Jerusalem. And being that they're His official followers' disciples, they begin to discuss who would be the greatest, who would be doing what role in the kingdom, in Jesus' kingdom. Maybe they had like those backdoor cabinet meetings. So you're going to be the guy for the interior. Or you'll be the guy for the exterior. And no, Judas, you will not be the treasurer. Or you'll be something else and you'll be this. And they start going back and forth. And as they're discussing who's going to do what, the question which often arises in every group is, who will be on top? Who will have the best seat? Luke describes their discussion in chapter 9, verses 46 to 48, as an argument. And later in Luke 22, verses 24 to 26, they're disputing again about who is the greatest. Later in Matthew's gospel, in chapter 20, verses 20 to 23, Zebedee's wife comes to claim the right and left-hand seats and thrones for her two sons. I'm sorry, I have a mental image about that I just can't shake off. Her two sons, in my mind, are great big hulking guys like American football linebackers. You know, American football, they're gigantic. And, and Zebedee's wife is this little lady, and she comes and she's dragging them by the fingers and going, right, let's talk about who's going to be where. And she argues for their place of prominence. And you see what Jesus is saying. He's going up to suffer, to die, to be crucified at the hands of the Jews. He talks to them about, if you want to follow me, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. So they engage him in the conversation. And they ask him, well, let's get it right from the king's mouth himself. Who's going to be greatest, Jesus? I can almost see Jesus just looking at them. And there's a little child nearby. And so he turns around and he beckons the little child. And he puts him right in the middle. And all these burly, hulking fishermen and tax collectors, disciples of Jesus, are all standing around looking at this little kid in the middle. And all that little kid's looking up at them. And the little kid to them is so insignificant. And Jesus makes that statement, Truly I say to you, plural, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Forget about who's on top. Let's talk about who gets in to start with. That was a radical shift for them. And no doubt they're like all of us, just stand there with their mouth kind of hanging open. What? What's going on? Have they not understood anything? But, you know, before we shake our heads and cluck our tongues, let's remember that their problem is the world's problem, which is also our problem. The problem of pursuing greatness is that it's almost always driven not by the desire to do good for others' benefit, but instead 
It's driven by prideful, selfish ambition. It's our own looking out for the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. Pride is a great problem we're all born with and deal with. In Genesis chapter 3, it was the woman's prideful desire to be wise, to be like God, to exercise her own will, not submit to God's will, that moved Eve to take and to eat of the forbidden fruit, to give it to her husband who also ate, and in so doing, they plunged the whole world into sin, as the Bible says. In Romans 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. And pride was at the root of the problem. Pride is a great evil, because it is a pretense to greatness and glory that belongs to God alone. These disciples are displaying a prideful pursuit for selfish greatness in God's kingdom when the only truly great one in the kingdom is God himself. The Bible condemns pride as evil. In Proverbs 21 and verse 4, it says, "...the haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked, is sin." The Bible describes pride as characteristic of Satan himself. In Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14, he's called the star of the morning, the sun of the dawn, and he said in his heart, listen, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. It's describing Satan's rebellion. Five times he uses the pronoun, I. It's all about me. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 6, the elders are told not to be a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. The devil's condemnation was his proud, his proud heart. The Bible tells us that pride leads to self-deception. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3, Paul says that if anyone thinks he is something, it's pride, when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Pride works an incredible work of deception in the one who has it, not just the ones around him. The Bible says that pride leads to spiritual blindness. In Deuteronomy 8, verses 13 to 14, Moses warned the people of Israel that when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Pride leads to spiritual blindness. You've all seen it in our own lives. Pride leads to a hardened heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart in pride against God. He refused to submit to God's command through Moses. He ended up dying under God's judgment underneath the Red Sea. Pride leads to destruction. Pride leads to a malicious spirit. Remember the story of Haman in the Old Testament, the book of Esther? He craved greatness of position where everybody but the king would bow down to him. But because of one man's refusal to bow in a jealous rage, he plotted the death of an entire race of God's people. But by God's design, it was turned on his own head and cost him his life and the lives of his ten sons because pride leads to destruction. Pride leads to quarreling and violence like these disputing disciples, for example. Jacob and Esau, Jacob and Laban, David and his murder of Uriah the Hittite, Absalom and his rebellion against David, Joab and his murder of Abner and Amasa. All these quarrels and violence spring from pride unleashed in the human heart. Pride leads to a contempt for others. It even leads to a contempt for God himself. The Bible says in Psalm 10 and verse 4, The wicked in his haughtiness of his countenance does not seek God. All his thoughts are, there is no God. Pride leads to a contempt even for God. 
Pride says, I will not have God to rule over me. I will rule my own life, my own way, for my own glory. I will not submit, not even to God's authority. And pride is at the root of these disciples' questions. Who of us, Jesus, which one of us will be the greater? Is actually, it's, it's a comparative. Which one of us is going to be greatest? Is it me or is it him? Is it me? Not him. Me. It's all about themselves. And, and you can almost sense the frustration in Jesus' heart as he looks at them and he realizes he's contemplating his death on behalf of all the people of the world to suffer and die, to set us free from sin. And these 12 men he's chosen to be with him, to be like him, are sitting here arguing about which one will be the greatest. Pride is the root of their question. That was the problem in their desire for greatness, and pride is our problem for all of us. We need to understand something, that the Bible only considers two types of people in relation to God. Two types of people, but with multiple descriptions. So we have the godly and the ungodly. We have the righteous and the wicked. We have the saved and the condemned. There's no middle, gray, neutral ground. This whole idea of a secular group of people is not a biblical idea. In the Bible's view, there's just two kinds of people, the godly and the ungodly, the wicked and the righteous, the saved and the condemned. Just two, that's it. And the godly are those, as Jesus describes here, who have been converted, who have become like little children, who are displaying a godly humility. But the ungodly are de demonstrated by the disciples. There are those who are still driven by pride. There are those who are still actively living, enslaved to a sinful life, who are still separated from God because of the sin of pride. And here is the great problem for them and for all of us. We all suffer from the drive of pride and selfishness. We all live enslaved to sin, and we all need to be converted from being ungodly and prideful and self-centered to being godly and humble and God-centered men and women. And if we are not converted, we will not enter God's kingdom. That's as clear as what Jesus says. He couldn't get any clearer, clearer about it. Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. My friend, listening to my voice or watching maybe the video, have you been converted? Have you become like little, dependent, trusting children? Does your conversion display itself in a godly humility, a humility that does not think less of yourself, but a humility that thinks of yourself less, that thinks of others more and thinks of God most of all. That's biblical humility. There is a necessity for us to be converted, to enter God's kingdom. So in verse 1, the disciples ask the question, who then is the greatest in the kingdom? And they, like their nation of the Jews, have assumed that being Jewish automatically gained them entrance into God's kingdom. And Jesus' answer must have shocked them. Not only does he not clarify who will be the greatest, he makes it strikingly clear there is no assumption of being included even for them. Being Jewish is not the necessary prerequisite. Instead, it's being converted. Jesus says similar things elsewhere. In Matthew 5 and verse 20, speaking on the mount to his disciples with the Jews sitting close by and listening, he said, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. In John 3 and verse 4, Jesus, displaying wonderful pastoral spirit, meets late at night with a Jewish Pharisee to speak to him about some concerns he has. And Jesus says to him, Truly, truly, 
I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. To this Jewish Pharisee, that would have rocked his world. He would have thought all through his growing up life, all through his ministry life, that because he was a Pharisee, because he made all these extra attempts to keep the law in every dimension, he would be automatically granted entrance into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Paul likewise repeats the prohibition in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. He says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So it's by conversion we enter the kingdom. So what does Jesus mean, unless you are converted? What's, what's he mean by that? The word is strafite, and it means a transformation, a change of position to turn around, to change one's ways. The word is a verb, but it's in the passive voice. You say, what does that mean? It means that the action happens to the subject. So if I, I'll pick on Andrew. If I say Andrew sits in the chair, well, Andrew is the subject and sitting is what he's doing on the chair. But if I say the chair is being sat on by Andrew, the chair is receiving the action of being sat on by Andrew. So in this case, when Jesus says, truly I say to you, unless you are converted in a passive sense, what he means is, unless God works on your heart to convert you and you become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The action happens to the subject. So biblically, conversion is a radical and complete transformation. It's to be changed from prideful disregard of God to humble submission to Christ. It is to be turned from disloyalty and disobedience to God to obedience and devotion to Christ. It is to be turned from indifference to God to love from God, to be turned from loving, committing, and serving sin to hating sin and doing everything we can to put it off. It is to be made, like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, new creatures in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. So how does it happen? How does this conversion happen to us? Notice again, Jesus says, unless you are converted, meaning we first receive the converting work of God in us. So the Bible says, I'll give you some biblical pictures of this. In 1 Kings 18 and verse 37, Elijah prays and he says, answer me, O Lord. Just to give some context, you remember he's up on Mount Carmel, right? All the prophets of Baal, they've been up there dancing around, cutting themselves, waiting from fire to fall from heaven to burn up their offering. It doesn't happen. And so Elijah goes and gets 12 buckets of water, pours them all over the offering and the stones and down into the trench. And he lifts up his hands. He begins to pray. And he prays, hear me, O Lord, and answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and have turned their heart back again. And while he's still praying, what happens? Fire falls from heaven burns up the altar, burns up the stones, and licks up the water in the trench. Powerful demonstration that that is truly God who is speaking, that God has turned their hearts. God has done the work on them. God has changed their inclinations to be toward Him, to be no longer towards sin and self. God inclines and draws and pulls us toward Himself. In John 6 and verse 44, the Bible says that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. In Ezekiel 36, listen to what God says. Listen to the converting work of God. There's seven things in this this, this, uh, passage, verses 25 to 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Seven converting actions that God performs on us first. In Acts 3.26 Peter says that God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning 
every one of you from your wicked ways. God has to do his converting work in us first. Because left to ourselves, we'll never turn towards God on our own. You say, no, I can turn if I want to. Listen to what the Bible says. This is God's holy, inspired word. And Paul the Apostle quotes both Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 to say this, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Oh, no, no, I'm the exception to the rule. No, you're not. Because the Bible says there's no exceptions to that rule. He repeats that none one, two, three, four times. And then caps it off with no, not one, emphatically stating it again. We as fallen, sinful human beings have no desire for God. Our selfish, prideful desire is always for ourselves and our interests. We will always pridefully seek for ourselves before all else. So God must do His converting work, turning and inclining us so that we can then secondly respond to His work. Before we consider our response, we need to understand something else here, that God not only does a converting work in us, He also commands us to turn toward Him in confession of sin and faith and repentance. The Bible says in Proverbs 1.23, Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit. That's a command for us to obey. In Isaiah 55 and verse 7, the Bible says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11, the Bible says, Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. And then God says, Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? You think, you know, it seems kind of cruel for God to tell us to turn and command us to turn knowing that we can't do it. Is that cruel? Well, when you understand it in its full context, it's not cruel. It's amazing, wonderful grace. And how does that work? God in grace does His converting work in us first. He turns our heart. He inclines us toward Him. He draws us to Him, allows us to see the beauty of who Christ is, the glory of the gospel. He turns our heart and inclines us toward Him, and then He calls us through the gospel to return to Him and repent of sin. He graciously, powerfully does the one thing we cannot do so we can then obey His command and do what pleases Him. You say, what obedience? Trust the Lord. Turn away from sin. That's it. But then there is yet a problem still to resolve. Hold on a second. How can God call us to come to Him, to return to Him? How can God promise us forgiveness of sin and mercy and life when we have all acted in rebellion, in disobedience, in pride, in selfishness? Does God merely allow bygones to be bygones? Ah, it's okay, no big deal. We'll just kind of sweep that under the carpet and not worry about it. No, absolutely not. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 15, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. If God were simply overlook your sin, just don't worry about it. It's no big deal. We'll just kind of fudge the books a bit. For God to do that would be for him to commit an abomination, to directly disobey his own word, to go against his own character and his own will. It is impossible for God to do that. He cannot simply overlook sin. He must judge the sinner. For God to disregard our sin would be for him to deny his word and deny himself, which is impossible. God is a righteous judge and God is a great Savior of sinners. Praise the Lord. Oh, I wouldn't be here. Paul said it 
that God might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That goes from Romans 3.25. And so here we have the great news of the gospel. God who is absolutely holy and righteous and just created us in His image, as John reminded us in prayer, to glorify Him by perfect obedience to Him. But Adam and Eve found a better way, and they sinned against God by disobeying God's single command. They received a sin nature within themselves. You notice what the first thing they did was? They didn't try to hide from God first. They tried to hide from each other first. Pulled out the leaves and started wrapping each other and kind of backing away. What's happening? Pride is creeping up. There's a sense of shame that's come in. It's all because of sin. And they gained that sin nature. It was, sorry, they received a sin nature within them that from then on compelled them to sin, to act in pride and disobedience to God. But it was not against their will. They sinned willingly. And brothers and sisters, men and women, listen, all of us have gained, have inherited that same sin nature from them because when they sinned, we were in them at that moment. So we have all sinned against God. We've all acted in prideful selfishness. We've all sought our own glory and not God's. We've all failed to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. All of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're all subject to God's wrath and condemnation for our sin. Left to ourselves, we would be inevitably falling under God's judgment and wrath to be endured for eternity in hell. That is the truth of the gospel from the scriptures. We have no excuse. We have no valid defense. We have no hope whatsoever. Our conscience will stand up in God's courtroom and testify against us. He did this and he did that and he said this and he said that and he thought this and he thought that. And our conscience will accuse us of all the sin that we have committed. We need, we desperately need somebody to save us from God's wrath against us. And the Bible tells us, but God being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in sins and trespasses, He sent Jesus Christ to be the propitiation for our sin. What's propitiation, you're thinking? It means that He endured and satisfied and placated all of God's anger and righteous indignation against you and I for our sin. He endured it all, and He satisfied it such that God could say, it's enough. It's finished. Christ came into the world, truly man and truly God. He was born of a virgin, truly, sorry, born of a virgin girl, truly man, yet without a sin nature. He lived in obscurity for 90% of His 33 years. Christ was obedient to His parents in everything. He was obedient to His heavenly Father in everything. Everything God told Him to say, He did. Everything God led Him to do, He did perfectly. He finished all the work His Father gave Him to do. Christ was willing to go and be delivered over by God into the hands of sinful men to be unjustly tried, brutally scourged, and horrifically crucified, not for any sin of His own, but for our sin. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21, you know it well, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ died in our place to pay our penalty for our sin. Christ was willing to give his life, dying by his own command. Christ's death is sufficient for every sinner ever conceived. Yet his death will be efficient for all who believe in him, who turn away from sin, who are converted by God's grace through Christ's death. Christ was buried for three days and three nights in a borrowed tomb. But praise God Almighty, he was raised from the dead by the power of God, and he lives forevermore, never to die again. God has raised him from the dead. God has exalted him to his own right hand, and God has seated him on his own throne. 
God in great grace now commands all men everywhere to repent of sin and believe the gospel. And God in grace does His work in us to turn us toward Himself that we may be able by His grace alone to repent, to believe, and to be forgiven. And as Jesus said to His disciples, to be converted. The moment, the moment we trust Christ for our salvation, the moment we begin that process of repentance, of turning away from sin and turning to God, we are converted. We become like the little child, a new creature in Christ. That little child that Jesus placed in their midst was a perfect illustration. A little child is trusting. You ever watch a little, little kid? I know you're not supposed to do this, right? So bear that with me. I, when I was little, or I was little, when my kids were little, I picked them up and I used to throw them up. Catch them, you know? Throw them up. And catch them again, right? And it didn't do them any harm, apparently, right? And that little kid, as they're going up, they're wee, and they're ah, coming down again. They're so trusting. They never once thought to themselves, my dad is clumsy, which I am, by the way. He's going to miss. I never did that. But they never thought that. My kids came home, and they wanted something to eat. They went to the cupboard and got something out and ate it. And they knew when they went back there the next time that mom would have refilled the cabinets and that there would be more food. They're absolutely dependent on us for everything. They trusted us without thinking. They didn't go there and go, hey, Dad, let's just see the bank accounts. You know, I want to make sure you've really got enough to support this family here. It's a good thing we didn't show them. They would have died of horror. And then they didn't go and say, hey, Mom, you, you sure you know what you're doing with that, all that shopping thing? No, now they go help her shop and they just keep adding food to the cart. It's great, right? What's the point? The point is a little child doesn't stop and think about all the problems associated. It just simply trusts. A little child knows what it is to be absolutely dependent and never think twice about it. A little child knows that in sense of insignificance in comparison to the adult. And so when Jesus puts this little child in front of him and says, you need to be like this little child, simply trusting, simply obeying. The moment we trust God for our salvation, the moment we begin that process of repentance, turning away from sin and turning to God, we're converted. We become like a little child, a new creature in Christ. So how does it all happen? How does it all go together? What's the process? Well, it's something like this, but the details will probably vary a little bit, but it's something like this. God brings into our lives someone who is willing to tell us the gospel story, a friend, a family member, a co-worker, a neighbor. For me, it was a camp counselor. They share the gospel with us that I just laid out. And as we're listening... God begins His work in our hearts to make us aware of our sinfulness. Never forget sitting on that camp bunk, listening to the gospel story, and knowing without a shadow of a doubt that I was a sinner, that I had no hope whatsoever outside of Christ, knowing that my sin was separating me from God, and knowing there was nothing I could do about it. As we're listening, God begins His work in our hearts to make us aware of our desperate situation, to make us aware that we need someone to save us from God's great wrath that is surely coming. Men and women, listen. God's wrath is coming. It will make COVID look like a tiny cough. It will make the wars that we see in this world like nothing. The Bible talks about a third of the earth's population being killed. The last great day when Jesus gathers all of the nations of all the humanity all together, he will gather his sheep to his right hand and the goats to his left, and he will turn to the goats and say, the goats of the unbelievers, sorry. He will say to the unbeliever, depart from me for I never knew you. And we will stand back as billions uh, swept into a lost eternity. And we will praise God for his righteousness and his holiness. And we will declare that Jesus is Lord. God's wrath 
is coming. That's not a popular message anymore. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you cannot say from the depth of your heart, I know that I have been converted by God, I tell you on the authority of Scripture, you will be swept away with the rest. But there's hope. There is an opportunity. You're not in this room because you just decided to get up and go to church today. You're in this room because God brought you here. By His sovereign grace, by His sovereign leading, God got you up out of your bed, helped you put your clothes on, got you in the car, and drove you safely all the way here and plunked you in your seat to hear what I'm telling you. Don't walk away from here saying, I never had a chance. I didn't know. I'm pleading with you. If you hear that voice deep in your own heart and your soul drawing you to come to Christ, telling you that you need to be saved, that's not my voice. That's God's voice. Listen. We hear the message. We understand that we must trust in God to save us from His own wrath, from death, from hell, and from sin. We respond because we want to. Nobody had to put a gun to my head when that day and say, you better trust Christ or I'm going to... No. I responded because in my heart it was just a sudden yearning, a craving. I had to know more about this God. I had to know for sure that when I went to bed that night and I went to sleep, if I woke up in heaven, I'd be in heaven there for the long haul. I had to know. There was a desire it's so deep, but just cried out for it. If you hear that and sense that in your own heart, that's God's Spirit calling your name to believe the gospel, to turn away from sin, to be right with God, to know God and to love God. So we simply believe and we turn away from sin. It's as simple as that. And God makes us new creatures in Christ. And within us, there is a new, strange sense of peace, of calm, and of rest. At night when I went to bed on my bunk, I had peace. I knew. Whatever happens, if this island drops into the middle of the sea, I was on an island off the coast of British Columbia, if it drops into the sea tonight, I'm safe. It's all good. There was a peace within my own heart. I read that over and over and over again. Men who came to Christ in many different types of ways, but the one thing they all said was the same. There was a peace within my heart that I knew that I was saved. I had a hope. There's a sense within that no matter what happens from now on, everything will be okay. No matter if we get persecuted, no matter if we lose family or friends, no matter if I lose my job, I lose everything that's valuable to me, it will be okay because I have new life in Christ. I have been made right with God. God has converted us. We've turned to God. The old is gone and the new has come. God has declared us righteous, just, and pardoned in His sight, and God fills us with His Holy Spirit to enable us to live to please Him. In that moment, speaking to the Christian here, brother and sister, in that moment, we were born into the church. Just as surely as the moment you were born in a hospital, maybe at home if long enough ago, you were born into a family. A mom and dad greeted you. So when we are born again, we're born into the church. We are part of the family of God. We're part of the church. We're part of the kingdom of God. Saved by grace through faith. Well, that was the first part of my message, and we'll leave the rest of it till next week. It's too long. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing, uh, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery, and then we'll go to the Lord's table. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we give thanks this morning for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And Father, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you, O oh God, for the converting work that you did in me. Father, I give thanks. I praise you, O oh God, for the converting work you have done in so many people in this room. And Father, for the one, two, perhaps five people standing here this morning in this room, they hear that voice calling them to come and trust in Christ, to come and believe the gospel, to turn away from sin and turn towards you, and they're resisting. Father, I pray, I plead with you, O oh God, that you would give them no rest and no peace until they turn and believe. Father, I pray that you would do a great work amongst all of us. Father, we thank you and we praise you, O oh God, for the great message of the gospel, the hope, the security we have like that little child. Father, we thank you for the fact that you make us new creatures in Christ. The old has gone and the new has come. Oh God, we bless you for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy, for your love. And we give thanks in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.